I've got a couple of questions already to uh, to kick us off. Um, the Chinese uh, domestic economy, as that uh, changes, uh, Tim. Um, uh, there, there's also predicted growth in uh, cars in particular uh, and I, one thing I noticed when I went there last time and I'm sure most people have noticed is that the roads are pretty darn congested, there's also not a lot of places to park cars as well. Um, how will that impact on uh, their, uh, uh, the, how will that drive their uh, infrastructure, the need for roads and so forth or will Chinese be encouraged to uh, park the car and take the bus? Um, that's a great question. In fact, I'd probably take that one myself, actually, for such a good question. I wouldn't go answer it. Um, the, the, that gets the whole point of what I was trying to say. Um, China is still a very mature country in many, many ways. So you look at the infrastructure, and they, they did build some wonderful roads, some wonderful bridges, and all that sort of good stuff, which look at, in quiet times, as if they are sort of way too much for the next five years, but then you get into Russia and you see that they are already clogged up. Um, so the reality is there's an awful lot more build to happen and lots of people will want cars. And the reality is, um, and this is the whole industrialization thesis for not just China but all the other countries, is the internet enabled people in China to see what we have and they want the same. So if they're going to want cars, they're not going to be able to stop them having cars. They're going to want it. The game that China's trying to play okay, very carefully is to make sure that not everyone moves to Beijing or Shanghai, which is where everyone wants to move to, but move them elsewhere around the, the country as well, so that they can have cities of um, reasonable enough size so that roads don't get too clogged. But I think absolutely expect everyone will want their own car at some stage or other. Now, maybe they won't quite get one each. And I presume but, they want to drive it on the road too? Yeah, absolutely right. And they'll be, but they're, they're, what they won't do, so, and they've got different levers which they're using all the time. Again, it's really a three hour tour, so they'll be careful about this. But the hukou system, which they basically have, which doesn't enable migrants to move to a different city and get access to healthcare or education and that sort of stuff, they are slowly changing that system. And how they would do it, I would think, is to make sure that people get hukou transfers if they go to newer cities which are going to be building not coming to the Beijing and the Shanghai's, which are already overpopulated. So, look, there's a huge chance they're going to head them, but I absolutely expect them to want everything we've got, which is why I think the long-term uh, demand for our commodities is going to be so huge. Yeah, they'll do public transport a lot better than we do. I mean, as a country, we probably do the worst public transport anywhere in the world, because we've got so few people and so much space, so we don't need to do it. But most other places do much better public transport than we do, and you'll see it in China for sure, but still we have cars. Drew, on the same note, obviously increased cars, but also the more people that are urbanised and increased energy consumption, uh, both of those energy sources uh, need oil and gas and other types of energy. How do you see that driving uh, demand in China, but not just China, India, other developing ca uh, countries as well? How do you see that driving demand for oil and gas? Very good question. I think um, you're right, China has industrialised amazingly over the last 10 years, but it has a long way to go. There's still a huge population which lives very basic, very low energy intensity lives that will um, themselves start to participate in China growth over the next 10 to 20 years. And then you're right, you look onto countries like India, which are probably on average a little bit further up the curve, but not as accelerating as, as fast. Um, the question I always worry about with China is um, China's population is going to age quite ra rapidly over the next 10 to 20 years and how that's going to impact the longer term growth. But there's some great charts the IEA produced which show um, GDP versus energy consumption and it shows countries like the UK and the US who 100, 150 years ago industrialised and they plot on the same charts countries like China and India and they're only just starting. Um, so there's a long way to go. The question is, is while um, the Western world went through this energy intensive process over the last 100 years, will China follow exactly the same path? Um, they, probably, they might skip a couple of the steps, um, and it's interesting how it'll pay out, but it's certainly demand's still increasing. We're still seeing oil demand grow one, one and a half percent a year for a long time yet. Drew, you mentioned India, and uh, I have a question for Tim here. Uh, it said you didn't have time 
to uh, discuss India much. Do you see that country driving up demand for minerals in the near future? Um, near future, no. Long term future, yes. Um, it, um, the Chinese system, why has China done this? Because the system of government enables, whereas the system of government India disenables, undoubtedly. But you've got one point whatever billion Indians who have access to the internet and see what they want and can see the Chinese getting wealthier and they aren't going to get happy. So if the government doesn't actually do it for India, the people will make it happen again. This goes to such a harmony piece of it. Um, and I do see that certainly happening. So look, India at some stage will definitely do it. I think with Modi as the Prime Minister, he's giving it a bit of a crack, probably the best crack we've seen for a long time. But um, it's very hard. It's not. He doesn't have the same power as Xi Jinping has in China to enable stuff to happen. He has to try to bring the states along to do stuff, which has been a battle for him. So I think realistically, uh, it'll continue to grow at 10% at a very low base, but it's not going to be moving the dial as much as we would like on commodities. But I do think, if I'm thinking the next 10 or 20 years ahead in the mining sector, um, and look at how Gina and Forest Palmer and those guys made lots of money. They picked China was going to need to, was going to grow, and they were short of iron ore very early on. So, I mean, looking at India 10 years hence, what are they short of? It's not iron ore, by the way, um, just to ignore that one, but some of the commodities which they're really short of, and see if you can go and find some future sources of that and park it away for when it does happen. Um, I don't, again, people haven't really looked into India hard enough, but I don't think it's short term, just. Drew, you spoke of a possible $70 oil price. Um, how, does, how do you think the Australian dollar in, will impact on that in that sort of same time frame? Predicting oil price and predicting the exchange rate are both very hard things to do. Um, the Australian dollar tends to be commodity linked. Oil is a commodity, um, it tends relatively the association of other commodity prices is relatively high. So the Australian dollar has provided a bit of a natural hedge to Australian um, producers, as it were. But in Australian dollar terms, the oil price is not down, it's probably down 45% as compared to the 60% of the US dollar exposed producers. That's a good thing. Um, for Australian consumers, it works the other way. It's holding the price we pay at the pump price we pay, we pay to drive our, our um, whole tax around, holding it up a, up a little bit. Of course, there's a huge tax component in there, so even the oil price doesn't, isn't the largest component of what we pay. Um, but yeah, the Australian dollar has been very good. It's been, it's taken a bit of pain out from this, I must emphasise, the Australian dollar exposed oil producers. Um, if you're building a big LNG project, it's a bit harder. Part of it will cost for Australian dollars, but a large part of the cost was US dollars. So that hedge is imperfect. Okay. Um, as we're talking about oil, uh, one of our uh, one of the people in the audience today asked us about the break-even oil price to justify the use of supply from North American shale uh, oil. Don't need to put all the caveats on it. Just <laughs> give us your best part. Um, it's, it's like um, assuming that there's one price, there's not, there's a whole range of prices. Um, cheap shale which probably makes sense at $40 a barrel, the expensive shale probably takes 110 and everything in between. The median shale oil producer, maybe $60, $65 a barrel, about where we sort of forecast the oil price to be. So the US shale is not going to leave the market completely, it's just going to be smaller and its rate of growth is going to be less. And I think this is part of the reason why um, Saudi Arabia is the biggest OPEC producer sort of acted um, late last year rather than trying to put a floor under price. They said, no, that's enough. We're going to, we're going to, sort of, we're going to defend our market share. We're not going to let the US keep producing oil when we need it. I think part of it was the fear that once the shale journey was out of the bottle, you couldn't put it back. So shale, shale's a very common common geology, it's all around the world. The industry has only emerged in the US so far because they've got a very dynamic industry and lots of installed infrastructure. If high oil prices had persisted for another five years, we would have ended up with the shale industry in Australia and in Canada and in Europe and in Russia. And then where's OPEC with Saudi Arabia? They're stuck in heavy towards irrelevance. 
so they could do that, but they have So I think they had to act, and that's one of the reasons why they have moved in the opposite direction to bring prices down. Um, Tim, a question for you. Is Australia better off economically with China experiencing moderate growth compared to the state fueled infrastructure growth of the past five to ten years? Longer term, yes, because China is more sustainable. Short answer like that. So I'll give you another question. Aside from reducing supply, what other measures do you believe resources companies should be using to reduce uh, uh, operating costs or to be more profitable? I think is probably. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very broad question. Um, I don't think we've really um, embraced technology enough. If I look at a mine today and I look at mine 30 years ago, they don't look that different, frankly. Whereas I look at other industries and how they've changed. So, I, and where we are using technology, it seems to be around the edges. And taking the driver out of a truck is nice, but it's, it's playing at the edges, not really changing the way we do things. So I'd like to see a lot more thought going into, hey, how do we totally disrupt our industry and change how we do things? Uh, maybe a bit more institute situ aging, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, guess a little bit, but I mean, I haven't seen the technological breakthroughs of the last 20 or 30 years that we used to have before that, so I think we need to do that to get across that. That's probably a good point. I think we've seen a lot of discussion around innovation and R&D in the copper trip strategy discussions, and. Uh, and I know that that's going to be on the agenda for the SACOM Council next year. Terry Burgess has uh, uh, just brought that up with me this week, in fact, that, uh, of how important innovation is for, for the industry. Okay, um, one last one, I think, for you, Tim. Um, the, uh, you, you mentioned production of uh, commodities or the overproduction of commodities by uh, major players. Is it a valid strategy to drive out the smaller players to deliver, to deliver long term above average profitability for their shareholders? <laughs> um, look, that's a very vexed question. Many of those big companies are big clients of us, so we're very careful how we answer this. Um, when I say oversupply, I'm not just talking about the big players, I'm talking about all players. And in fact, it's the higher cost ones who have probably been too sticky and haven't actually left the industry or paused or found a way to halt production, but instead of put more on, which I don't think has necessarily been a good thing. Um, the big guys, well, I guess again, we have got to be careful we don't get the iron order weight here, which again is a very vexed thing. Look, just as a generalisation, there hasn't been enough thought as to how we reduce the level of supply and stop oversupplying in any industry when collectively we're putting more new stuff on than demand is coming, then it's not going to end well. And I think that for everyone it's just, it's, that, that holds true. I don't believe that the big companies purposely want to get rid of the, old, the smaller companies because I just don't think they see them as their natural competitors, frankly. But um, clearly they are bringing lots of new product to, to the marketplace, which is hurting all. Last question, this one's for you, Joy. Drew, oil price is widely discussed uh, today, but Australia is very much a gas market, or at least around domestic gas supplies. There's a lot of discussion around uh, that at the present time, that we have a shortage of gas in, in the eastern states or so. Uh, how, do, how does the oil price and the gas price, domestic gas price relate, and what is the gas outlook for Australia? Uh, fundamentally, there's no shortage of gas in Australia. The only real question is at what, what price will we have to pay for it. Um, the marginal cost of production is going up. Um, gas there in Bass Strait into um, Victoria and the south of South East States is rising. The cost to build projects has gone up. Um, there is also a degree of, with the three big LNG projects starting in Gladstone, there will be an element of net back competition so the net back of LNG price that people are paying in Asia back to the Australian market. That won't be, on the current oil prices, the impact of that won't be as severe as everyone was fearing um, 18 months, 30 years ago. The prices are going up. We have to sort of get our heads around the idea that $4 a gigajoule gas was effectively the cheapest gas in the world, and we had that for a long time. The cost of produced gas now, the marginal cost of production, is getting closer to six and a half, seven dollars you should be thinking about that's where the gas prices are going to head. Um, 
the reason they're getting around it, but that, that kind of original point is fundamentally no shortage of gas. We've got gas supplies in Australia for hundreds of years. If we're going to extract the economic benefit of that, no point leaving it in the ground, we will be exported as LNG. We've got a lot of projects being constructed at the moment. We're probably going to have a pause in the construction process because oil prices are low, but ultimately that gas will go to Asia. Now, I'm going to ask you both just to give us a, a pearl of wisdom or something to leave everybody with today. But whilst you're thinking about that for a moment, I will ask Michael Rosengren from uh, KJM uh, to come up and uh, give a vote of thanks. So hopefully that's given you just a few moments extra to think about that pearl of wisdom. I should have warned you about that beforehand, uh, but um, who'd like to go first? Um, yeah, thanks for the warning. Um, we've got to learn, and we keep on repeating what we do. So my comment to everyone is, let's learn from this moment. It is a nasty point of time. And see what we've done wrong as an industry. Make sure we don't repeat that. Okay. Uh, industries are cyclical. We do need to learn. But there are products out there which you can use to smooth out volatility price, you can hedge. Hedging was a dirty word in the Australian industry for a long time, but with hindsight, I don't know what's we should be hedged when prices are at all time high. You know, hedge all your production just enough to help you cover your operating costs if you get that balance right case, because it won't be there. But it can keep you in business and get you through. Okay. Thank you.